A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. Avoid giving offense, whether to Jews or Greeks or the Church of God, just as I try to please everyone in every way, not seeking my own benefit, but that of the many, that they may be saved. Be imitators of me, as I am of Christ. The word of the Lord. I will bless the Lord at all times. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall be ever in my mouth. Let my soul glory in the Lord. The lowly will hear me and be glad. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us together extol his name. I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Look to him that you may be radiant with joy, and your faces may not blush with shame. When the poor one called out, the Lord heard, and from all his distress he saved him. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Taste and see how good the Lord is. Bless the man who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his holy ones, for naught is lacking to those who fear him. The great grow poor and hungry, but those who seek the Lord want for no good thing. Dominus Vobiscum, et cum spiritu tuo, Lexia Sancti Evangelii secundum Lucam, Gloria tibi Domine. Great crowds were traveling with Jesus, and he turned and addressed them, If anyone comes to me without hating, his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Which of you wishing to construct a tower does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if there is enough for its completion? Otherwise, after laying the foundation and finding himself unable to finish, the onlookers should laugh at him and say, this one began to build, but did not have the resources to finish. Or what king marching into battle would not first sit down and decide whether with 10,000 troops he can successfully oppose another king of, 
advancing upon him with 20,000 troops. But if not, while he is still far away, he will send a delegation to ask for peace terms. In the same way, <clears throat> every one of you who does not renounce all of his possessions cannot be my disciple. Verbum Domini. Today we celebrate the memorial of St. Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits, the Society of Jesus. He lived from 1491 to 1556. He died at 64 years of age. And he had a conversion experience right in the heart of the Protestant uh, Reformation. Luther was excommunicated in 1521, and that was the year of uh, Ignatius's conversion. He would say that by knowing, loving, and serving God on earth, we would achieve our, our full supreme end in the hereafter, the self-fulfillment by praising and enjoying God and the beatific vision. So he would guide the order to make all their activities result and have its goal to praise uh, for the glory of God, and that was their motto, all for the greater glory of God. He came from a noble family. He was very ambitious for the things of this world. He wanted to do great feats of, of military conquests, of chivalry, and he was, uh, had quite an interest in fine clothes. I was reading that he was very fastidious by his own admission about his own appearance, uh, long hair, bright color clothing, cape, the whole nine yards. <laughs> he had a desire for worldly praise and glory, he wanted to distinguish himself by even reckless deeds of bravery. And even though he wasn't a professional soldier in 1521, he wanted this military glory, and there was a French army besieging Pamplona. And even though it was futile, he urged this resistance to keep on fighting the French. It was hopeless, but he showed great courage and bravery. And he was struck by a cannonball that actually hit both of his legs, and one completely shattered one of his legs and broke the other. And the French respected his bravery so much that they, they carried him to his hometown of Loyola for his convalescence. And he bore these uh, very painful surgeries, even at one point having to re-break the leg and saw off part of a bone <laughs> poking out from his, his flesh. You know, incredible endurance. And he, in his uh, autobiography, would describe his life that he was a man given to the follies of the world. And what he enjoyed most was warlike sport with a great and foolish desire to win fame. He was particularly careless about gambling, affairs with women, and the use of arms. At the age of 24, he was prosecuted for misdemeanors which were, quote, outrageous, committed at carnival time at night. So I guess he was quite a quite a problem in different times in his life. And when he was convalescing in Loyola, it's a beautiful place in the Basque region of Spain, he asked his, at the family estate, he asked for no novels of chivalry. He loved to ponder these things. And instead, all he could find was a, a book on the life of Christ and a book of the lives of the saints. And he saw these saints reading about them as knights of God, that they did these great deeds uh, for the Lord at the service of Jesus Christ. And it took hold of his heart. You know, he wanted to give himself an outstanding service to Christ. And he would still have these daydreams about chivalry and military conquests. But even after indulging in these things, he would find himself left dry and dissatisfied. If you think about ourselves and our culture, you may maybe after you know watching a lot of television or something, you know, it can leave us with a feeling of emptiness. You know, it's not fulfilling, it's not inspiring on a deeper level. 
But he found that when he did pious practices and reading and meditation on the things of God, it left him satisfied and joyful. In the biography, he writes that little by little he came to recognize the difference between the spirits that were stirring him and one was from God and one was from the devil. And this is, would be a prominent characteristic of his spirituality, this discernment of spirits. You know, which one is he giving into? What does he have to turn from? Which one does he have to embrace? But after he convalesced, he went to Manresa for one year. This was near the shrine of Our Lady, Montserrat. Because while convalescing, he had a vision of Our Lady with the Christ child. He was very deeply moved. And he went and lived in a cave and with different religious communities around Montserrat and did great penance, spent hours and hours in prayer, and he embraced the spiritual life in a much deeper way. And he had great trials of scrupulosity and various temptations, but he embraced uh, poverty, of chastity, and obedience, made general confessions, and attempted a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. And then he would go on to give biographers write a third of the remainder of his life to studies. He studied at various schools in Spain. He ended up at the University of Paris, but at these different schools he ran into problems. The Spanish Inquisition was alive and well. He would get in trouble with them at times. At, at a university in Barcelona he was beaten senseless, and a companion he was with was actually killed because of a reform they were trying to lead at a convent. At Alcala, he was imprisoned for two months. At Salamanca, he was imprisoned for a time. At the University of Paris, he had various trials of, of poverty and the plague, and at one time, sentenced to a public flogging by the rector of the college, but later the rector recanted. <laughs> I love these images of him, because he's got this, he's just a bundle of fire and energy that clearly has to be harnessed for the greater glory of God. But, it, you know, if you can channel that, it's such a great gift and be transformative, you know, to set the world on fire. He finished his studies and he founded the Companions of Jesus. The Pope named him the Society of Jesus. And he, at that time in Manresa, he began a, a, a spiritual diary that would became, become his spiritual exercises. And he had made three attempts to start the order. And finally he and I believe it was six others founded the order. One was uh, St. Francis Xavier. And their mission was, you know, to do any foreign missions that the Pope had asked. They had this fourth vow of obedience to the Pope, of just absolute obedience, whatever he wanted them to do to educate the youth, to instruct the ignorant and the poor, to minister to the sick and the imprisoned. And while in Rome, founding a, their school there, he performed these good works. And he also received the private vows from a patroness of his from Spain. And along with two other, uh, two other women, they would come to him for spiritual direction. And he would say, they caused me more trouble than the whole of the society, you know, working with these women. So they brought him to his knees, I guess. But he had a, a great love uh, for the poor, those in need of direction. And of course, his spiritual exercises would bless, bless so many. And in 1556, he contracted a, a fever and died. <clears throat> he would say, in spreading the faith, and even though he was this a you know, very strong personality, he would say that great care must be taken to show forth orthodox truth in such a way that if any heretics happen to be present, they may have an example of charity and Christian moderation. No hard words should be used, nor any sort of contempt for their errors be shown. And remember, he's, this, he's, you know, he's living in the time of the, the Protestant Reformation and doing a lot of work, you know, to, to propose to proclaim the, the Catholic faith during that time. So he had a lot of experience. As I said, you know, he wanted 
to be a, a military man, had a great influence on his life. He wasn't a professional soldier, but obviously had a longing for that kind of disciplined life. And the gospel today chosen for his memorial, I think, taps into that. This passage from Luke's gospel to me, it strikes me almost as a military speech, you know, that Jesus himself uses a, an analogy to the king who's going to go out to battle. You know, he calculates if he can win this or if he should make peace, you know, that we have to make a calculation of, of what's holding us back from the Lord. The message of the gospel here is that, you know, we are to renounce all possessions, everything. That's the calculation, that's the decision, that's the discernment we have to make, is like what's holding us back. And the passage begins that he, he has great crowds were traveling with Jesus. Great crowds were traveling. But, you know, he turns and addresses them and said, if anyone comes after me, you know, he must hate his own family, even his own, you know, this is an exaggerated term, we're to love everyone, but he's making the point of God comes first, above our family, above our own life, and we must take up our cross, we must carry our cross. Whatever sufferings and trials, we can't flee from them at all costs, but actually embrace them for the glory of God, and ultimately renounce all our possessions. So Jesus is above everything. You could picture like in great literature or movies, you know, you have a big battle, you have a general makes the speech to his soldiers, you know, we have to win this battle. This is what it's going to take. And it might cost you everything. And Jesus is saying that, you know, we are called to set our hearts completely on him. And there's something in us that wants that, right? We want especially when we're young, I think it's a gift given to the young that they want to give themselves generously to some cause, to something big, you know, to a higher purpose, a higher meaning to life. And the kingdom demands all. It's discipleship versus just traveling with Jesus in a big crowd. Jesus wants discipleship. He wants this total commitment, that he is the pearl of great price. He is the treasure buried in the field. He is the goal of our hearts. But we live in a fallen world. We have a fallen human nature. We're beset with various weaknesses, and our hearts get easily distracted and attached to other things. How do we bring our hearts back to him? We all experience this. How do we continually bring our hearts back to him? And one of the great contributions that St. Ignatius, St. Ignatius made was the daily examine. And this is at the heart of his spiritual exercises. And he would command his brothers to do this multiple times throughout the day. And I, I think, if I'm understanding it right, it seems rather simple. And I've been trying to practice it myself. It's been a great blessing for me and he would exhort them to begin this examine, this daily prayer multiple times during the day, to begin with thanksgiving, that this is absolutely essential, and to show an ingratitude to God for his gifts to us is just a terrible, terrible sin, you know, not to have that gratitude towards God. So we could begin it just with listing different things in our life that we are thankful for, different gifts, benefits, blessings, people, situations in our life, his providence over us. And I think in doing that, it sets us to recognize that, hey, God really is present, active in my life, that yes, I have trials, struggles, difficulties, sufferings, experienced losses, you know, the list is endless. We've got a lot of bad stuff happening in many ways. But if we pause, we can also recognize that God is there. And it, it, it reminds us that God loves us. It might be through some support of a friend. It might be a consolation. 
It might be some bit of providence. You know, it might be you know, some, in some way that God encourages us you know, during the day. So list like 10 things or something you know, to begin that prayer. And then he would say to pray to the Holy Spirit that our hearts might be enlightened, that we might see ourselves more clearly, to look at what we need to repent of, what we need to discern and change in our life. And he would say to look at uh, the consolations that we had that day. And he would describe this as movements of the soul to be inflamed with love of God or his goodness or just good things. You know, how are we, at what moments were we drawn to do the good, a longing for the good, or what helped to increase our faith, hope, and love, or maybe a sorrow for sin, you know, that and that's a grace in itself, to regret the sins of our past. Or what led us to an interior joy, or, or just drawn to heavenly things, or to quiet and peace in the Lord. What led us to find that, that peace in him, to experience that peace in him? And then we also look at what he described as the desolation that we might experience. These are movements to doubt or despair, or to a attachment and inordinate love to earthly things, or a decrease of love of God or heavenly things, or where would we lose that peace, or where were we disturbed? Did it follow some action we did or some thoughts we were embracing? You know, what led us to temptation or disquiet? What dispelled the temptation maybe that we had? Maybe it was turning to God in prayer or talking with someone or sharing it with someone might have relieved that temptation or what led us into tepidity or laziness or separation and then we can the next step would be to repent of those things and to make a purpose of amendment you know okay going forward the rest of the day or the next day what are we going to do differently to foster that that consolation that leads us deeper to the lord and in examining that life our life, you know, I think it leads us to, ch to, ha to make a decision. You know, we have to engage ourselves with the Lord. To be a disciple and to move our hearts to him takes an engagement, decisions. It takes actions that move us to the Lord. And God doesn't do that without our cooperation. He's always given us that grace to call us to himself. But we are to cooperate, to respond, to take some action with that grace, you know, to, to move towards the Lord. And it's, it could be so simple and gentle, you know, this examination, I think, and to make these decisions in our life. And we wind up, you know, doing this, and our life does become for the honor and glory of God. We do glorify him if we're constantly moving our hearts back towards him. So we ask St. Ignatius to pray for us that we may be faithful to the spiritual life to be able to live this calling of Christ of radical renunciation of everything else. You know, people, laity in the world, yes, you're engaging the temporal affairs of this world. You know, you live in the world, so you have these things but our hearts are still called to be detached from them and to be serving his honor and glory.